people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain and other major Islamic nations have honored India's Prime Minister with their highest civilian honor. This is a testament to India's closeness with the Middle East and a changing foreign policy that has become increasingly focused on strengthening relationships with the Arab world. A strong India-Middle East connection not only diversifies an aspirational India's strategic interests but also serves the country's commercial needs. Egypt, a political heavyweight similarly committed to fighting terrorism and which also boasts one of the biggest economies on the African continent with great trade prospects, is an ideal partner for India. Join us as we take a closer look at the India-Egypt relationship and see how two ancient cultures rekindling their bonds will prove to be equally fruitful in a geopolitical landscape that is becoming increasingly dominated by the global south. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi was the chief guest at India's annual Republic Day celebrations last month. His visit held huge significance, for this was the second time an Arab world leader was invited to one of India's most important events in only six years. This is even more significant given that for 2021 and 2022, India did not have any chief guests owing to the COVID-19 pandemic. India, which is fast emerging as a dominant force in the rapidly evolving global geopolitical scene, is focused on bolstering relations with the Middle East. The reasoning behind this push is simple. Firstly, the Arab world and the Middle East's strategic and economic importance cannot be ignored. And secondly, India, who is increasingly being recognized as a global leader, cannot be exclusionary in its outlook and approach. Egypt, also called the Gateway to Africa, is a dual-layered opportunity and prospect for India. And India, being one of the biggest economies and consumers in the world, can cater to the market needs of Egypt. Both countries have acknowledged that their symbiotic relationship could be of great significance to their people. They have agreed to elevate the terms of their engagement to a strategic partnership. हमारी द्विपक्षीय भागीदारी को स्ट्रेटेजिक पार्टनरशिप के स्तर पर ले जाने का निर्णय लिया है हमने तय किया है कि भारत इजिप्त स्ट्रेटेजिक पार्टनरशिप के तहत हम राजनीतिक सुरक्षा आर्थिक एवं वैज्ञानिक क्षेत्रों में और अधिक व्यापक सहयोग का लॉन्ग टर्म ढांचा विकसित करेंगे हमने मिलकर यह तय किया कि अगले पांच वर्षों में हम अपने द्विपक्षीय व्यापार को 12 बिलियन डॉलर तक ले जाएंगे। The bilateral trade between India and Egypt has experienced a boom in recent years, so much so that even the pandemic could not hamper its expansion. The trade between the two countries amounted to 7.26 billion USD in 2021 to 2022. This was 75% more than the previous year. India exported goods and merchandise worth 3.74 billion USD in this period as well, registering a 65% increase compared with financial year 2020 to 2021. Apart from this, some 50 Indian companies, including the renowned Mahindra, Godrej, and Dabur India, have invested in Egypt, with combined receipts of 3.15 billion USD. When the wheat supply from Ukraine to Egypt hit roadblocks created by the Russia-Ukraine conflict, India came to the rescue. 61,500 metric tons of wheat was cleared for Egypt by India in May of last year. While trade has been a dominant aspect of Indian foreign policy, what sets Egypt apart from other Arab countries where religious prejudices have often trumped rationale 
is its moderate and measured voice. New Delhi and Cairo have also committed to jointly combating the menace of terrorism. لمزيد من التنسيق في ذلك المجال الحيوي فلا تنمية بدون استقرار أمني. كما استعرضت مع دولة رئيس الوزراء ما أسفرت عنه القمة العالمية للمناخ كاب 27 بشرم الشيخ من نتائج مهمة خاصة ما يتعلق بإنشاء صندوق لتمويل الخسائر والأضرار المترتبة على التغيرات المناخية لا سيما في الدول النامية التي تعاني فيها البنية التحتية من الضعف وعدم القدرة على الصمود أمام آثار التغيرات المناخية Several experts have opined that a collective Arab world position on terrorism and its perpetrators could strengthen India's case against the terror export hub of Pakistan. Diplomacy and trade will play a key role in the course ahead. Egypt could be of great significance to India for both its political and strategic needs and also to deepen and strengthen its presence in Africa. For now, Egypt and India have set out on a voyage that will resurrect the ancient past when India and Egypt were the cradles of technically advanced civilizations and the envy of the world. Moving on. As the human rights situation deteriorates further in Taliban ruled Afghanistan, the United Nations has urged countries around the world to continue supporting the struggling country. The Taliban recently imposed a ban on women working in non-governmental organizations. The decision had drawn criticism from across the spectrum. With widespread food shortages and a deteriorating human rights situation, the United Nations stated that it has become even more critical for the international community to unite in support of Afghans. Meanwhile, the government of India allocated over 20 million US dollars for Afghanistan in its annual budget announced on February 1 this year. Afghanistan is returning to the previous Taliban era with no respite appearing in sight. While majority of the population has plunged into poverty bracket, many independent organizations have feared that famine may hit the country anytime. The Taliban, which was zestful while regaining the control of the country, is now failing to meet even the basic needs of its people. The head of UN aid and member states recently discussed how everyone should work together to come up with a plan to keep sending aid to Afghanistan once the Taliban regime imposes a ban on the majority of female aid workers in December 2022. UN Assistance Director Martin Griffiths guaranteed that humanitarian organizations will continue to operate in Afghanistan while pursuing exceptions to the alleged ban while speaking at a United Nations session intended to advise nations on his recent visit to Kabul. Humanitarian agencies will continue to work, will be present in Afghanistan, unless and until there is a blanket opposition to the role of women. Where exceptions exist, we will work. Where it's possible uh, to, to, to find more of those exceptions, more sectors, I'll come back to that, we will push for that. For that. The humanitarian community does not go on strike. It seeks ways to try to find ways to work. Since the Taliban took control, no foreign nation has firmly recognized it. Some diplomats believe that this is because the Taliban government need to reverse its position on women's rights. Many nations have raised grave concerns about the fact that the majority of girls and women over the age of 12 are prohibited from entering school or higher education. More than half of the population is now dependent on humanitarian aid to meet critical needs as a result of the country's economic crisis, which has been exacerbated by the enforcement of sanctions and a reduction in development funding. Last month, the Taliban-led government issued an order prohibiting the majority of female employees from working for NGOs. As a result, several aid organizations had to largely halt their operations as a humanitarian crisis developed amid a severely cold winter. It was not the time to redirect funding to other situations, Care International Secretary General Sophia Spreckman's scenario said in a statement to donors and member states. We ask for continued support and engagement at this critical time 
this is not the time to reduce or divert funds to another crisis or to other crises. Actually, I would say that more than ever in the entire history of Afghanistan, this is the time donors need to stand by the Afghan people and be a source of hope. After breaking their pledge to give women a dignified living during their second term, many women have left Afghanistan. Some people who eventually made it to Spain and the United States after overcoming many obstacles claim that the situation had become very serious there. Many analysts have stated that if Afghanistan wants its people to have even the most basic levels of living, it should quickly revert its calls. Numerous people have already perished as a result of not having enough fuel to keep their homes warm during this year's bitterly cold winters. There is no one to save the region's so-called government because they have ran out of money, thus it is highly doubtful that things will get any better. Hat Kathior wearable art handcrafted from a designer's unique vision. The term is French and the industry has long been dominated by European designers until now. Indian designers have arrived on the hot couture scene, bringing with them their fine skills, exquisite and rich history, deeply rooted in centuries of Indian artisanship. Let's have a look at how Indian designers have broken into one of the world's most exclusive clubs and the benefits to brand India and the Indian fashion and couture industry in years to come. Indian designer Rahul Mishra presented his Cosmos collection at Paris Haute Couture Fashion Week on January 23rd. Mishra is the first Indian designer to have been invited to show his collection at this prestigious event, having debuted in Paris last year. This year, Mishra was joined by Gaurav Gupta, who presented his collection on January 26th, Republic Day. Haute couture, or literally, high sewing, is the creation of high-end, custom-fitted pieces made by hand from beginning to end. Mishra's Cosmos collection, for example, showcased pieces which took from between 400 hours to 7,000 hours to make. Mishra has also been known to employ artisans from various villages across India who all worked from their homes. This cosmos is not just a collection, it's an, it's an idea of, of inclusivity, idea that does not showcase my excellence, the idea which showcase a group's excellence, the idea which showcase this best of craftsmanship, which in a most simple form can happen from, from different villages. So today we engage and work with, uh, with at least eight to nine hundred villagers on a regular level. For those familiar with the fashion industry in India, the amount of painstaking work which goes into various garments is no surprise. With two great Indian designers already being featured on one of the world's most exclusive runways, there is sure to be more attention and focus on the fashion and couture industry in India. The haute couture fashion industry was estimated at 11472.61 million USD in 2021 and is projected to reach 13456.6 million USD by 2028, exhibiting a compound annual growth rate of 2.3% during this period. While Indian designers are only beginning to attain their much deserved recognition in the world of haute couture, the textile and apparel industry in India has long been strong across the spectrum from fiber, yarn, and fabric to apparel. India's ready-made garment exports are expected to see a compound annual growth rate of 12 to 13 percent and surpass 30 billion USD by 2027. The industry is the second largest employer in India after agriculture. 
India's textile exports were also the highest ever during the financial year 2021 to 2022, surpassing 44 billion USD. Growth drivers of the industry include an abundance of raw materials, competitive manufacturing costs, and availability of skilled labor. We follow all the compliance rules. We are no longer a cottage industry. We now have regular big factories, whether it is in Noida or in Delhi or in Gurgaon or in, or in Bangalore or in Mumbai. What's important is we operate as factories now. We have the supply chain logistics with us, which we didn't have earlier. There is also significant foreign direct investment in the textile industry, with FDI bringing in 1522.23 million USD from 2017 to 2022. The government's efforts, including the Production Linked Incentive Scheme, with an approved outlay of 10,683 crore, will allow the industry to compete globally. With India's strong economic foundation and rapidly expanding middle class, the fashion industry in India is expected to become increasingly organized and profitable. The Fashion Design Council of India, FDIC, which is committed to furthering the cause of Indian fashion and to endorsing and encouraging Indian designers to grow their brand sustainably, both domestically and internationally, is and will continue to be a key driver of this push. Sunil Sethi, FDIC's head, is confident that the Indian fashion industry will continue to grow over the next few years, with business having returned to pre-pandemic levels. Much of Indian fashion was solely focused on bridal wear and ethnic wear. With increased demand, locally and globally, Indian designers are on track to take the world's runway by storm. With Rahul Mishra and Gaurav Gupta already holding their own amongst the world's top couturiers, Grand India's take on the global fashion industry is soon to be another notch in her belt. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. The Philippines has granted the United States expanded access to its military bases, the defense chief said this week amid mounting concern over China's increasing assertiveness in the disputed South China Sea and tensions over self-ruled Taiwan. Washington would be given access to four more locations under the 2014 Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement or EDCA. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and Philippines Defense Secretary Carlito Galvez said in a joint news conference. Austin, who was in the Philippines for talks, as Washington seeks to extend its security options in the country as parts of efforts to deter any move by China against self-ruled Taiwan. Both sides reaffirmed their commitment to bolstering their country's alliance. The EDCA allows U.S. access to Philippine military bases for joint training, pre-positioning of equipment and the building of facilities such as runways, fuel shortage and military housing, but not a permanent presence. Japan's archipelago features a variety of tourist destinations on both the mainland and other islands. All Nippon Airways or ANA contributes to connecting these attractive spots by flight. Shikoku, one of the islands, has a very appealing tourism spot in Iheim Prefecture. It charms and satisfies visitors. Kimono, an influencer with 1.4 million followers, mom and her family come to Iheim. Iheim is well known for its mandarin orange production. At the airport, this water supply supplies mandarin orange juice. Sayuri Kurokawa is an ANA cabin attendant and a good informant of Iheim's charm. She also has a job on a mandarin orange farm. ANA intends to grow mandarin oranges under its control and supply their juice on flights. Iheim has its famous local cooking, 
sea bream and rice. Eheim has the island for a farm of sea bream. That meal provides enjoyment of raw fish, white rice and Japanese soup. They are the substance of Japanese cooking taste. Kimono Mom is moving to Matsuyama Castle by lift. Matsuyama Castle has a castle town that was built before the Edo period in the 17th century. It is surrounded by a 10 meter high stone wall and its site is 4500 square meters. Old, tough and vast are the characteristics of Matsuyama Castle. Shimanami Kaido is a 60 km road on the bridge connecting Hiroshima Prefecture and Ihain Prefecture in Imabari City. Cars and bicycles can run on the road and riders enjoy the big landscape below the Seto Inland Sea. Every day the tides in the Seto Inland Sea change by 4 feet. The whirling tide produced a historical event. It provided a significant advantage to local pirates in the 14th century. To focus on tourism for foreign travelers, the Japanese credit giant JCB is planning a significant cashback promotion. It will continue till April. That benefit is limited to foreign issued JCB card holders. Qualifying status is held by 34 million card holders. JCB's member store Daimaru is one of the Japan's largest department stores, attracting many customers every day. Daimaru is looking forward to an increase in inbound customers in addition to Japanese customers. The JCB card is available for use in every member shop in Japan. Foreign tourists benefit greatly from JCP's hospitality. Furthermore, it helps to boost the local economy. Moving on. India, a land of diverse landscapes, provides tourists everything they want to see. From vast beaches to serene mountains, India has it all. Today in our episode, we have brought for you a special winter carnival that was organized recently in the Kupwara region of Jammu and Kashmir. Hundreds of tourists turned up for the event that locals believe will become a spectacle to watch in future. People in the northern town of Kupwara, known for the ancient Sadbaran caves, celebrated the winter carnival with gaiety and harmony. Excitement and enthusiasm were palpable in the air as people from across the country reached the site to celebrate the carnival. Such festivals, which are organized annually at other places, have emerged as massive crowd pillars. This year's event also saw a large number of tourists who came specifically for this event. Such events are also said to bring people from all walks of life together in one place. आप देख रहे हैं लोगों का कितना हुजूम है लोग किस तरह इतनी सर्दी में आ रहे हैं ये तो हमारे लिए हमारे लोगों के लिए हमारे डिस्ट के लिए बहुत ही अच्छा शुगुन है ऐसे इनिशिएटिव लिए जाएंगे कारवेंटर में भी आज भी कल भी लेंगे हर जगह पर लेंगे तो नवजवानों को रोजगार मिलेगा Rich in culture and diversity Jammu and Kashmir is well known for its people's unity Young women dressed beautifully in fair and attire were seen performing traditional dances at the carnival. Locals and organizers said they were immensely benefited by such a huge crowd turning up for the festival. They said they were working hard to further improve the quality of the experience for people who come for the festival. और मैं बहुत-बहुत खुश हूँ, बहुत-बहुत 
खुश इस बात से ज्यादा हूँ कि जो रिस्पॉन्स मैं देख रहा हूँ जब मैं आ रहा था इस तरफ जो जिस तरह से लोग पार्टिसिपेट करने के लिए आ रहे हैं बहुत बहुत मुबारकबाद है लोगों को कुपवारा के आवाम को The soothing beauty of Jammu and Kashmir can make anyone fall in love with it. The serene beauty of the nature provides tourists a unique experience of both calmness and excitement. This carnival was organized to uphold and encourage tourism and bring tourists to underrated but beautiful places like Kupwara. And it is safe to say that the festival has accomplished what it set out to do and will gain even more in the future. Jammu and Kashmir is one of the most visited places in the country with youth travel bucket list keeping the region on top. With that we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.